हरि ओम श्री गुरभ्यो नम हरि ओम Jay Lakhani, an excellent communicator of Hinduism in Britain and director of the Hindu Academy, the Vivekananda Center in London. Over the last 15 years, Sri Lakhani has given talks on Hinduism to thousands of youngsters at English schools, colleges, and universities. If you wish to get a glimpse of the modern, dynamic face of Hinduism, then do not miss this series of talks. Okay, the session this morning is going to be on scriptures. What are scriptures? Sim in simple English, scriptures are holy books. Every religion will have certain, some books they call holy or sacred. And we're going to study sacred texts or sacred books of the Hindus today. Now, why are scriptures important? The first question arises. You see, if you wanted to learn about religion, the Hindu religion will tell you the best people who can tell you about religion are those people who say, we can experience God for ourselves. They are the number one, the best proponent of religion, people who claim first-hand experience of God. And there's a generic title we give these people, Rishi, somebody who can see or experience God. And this is essential, this is the first port of call. If you want to study about religion, study your religion, the first port of call should be Rishi, a person who is able to talk about religion from his own experience because he can give you first-hand knowledge of religion. But Rishis are difficult to get by. You can't find them easily. You can't, you know, look up your yellow pages and say, ah, Rishi, oh yes, Hero Road, whatever, you know. They're tricky. They're not easy to find. And if they are there, they may not even want to announce themselves. They may be very, keep themselves very aloof. They may not mix with you at all. So it's difficult to find them. The second place where we can, you know, second port of call should be the scriptures. What are scriptures? Now the scriptures are, if you like, what the rishis tell us about God or what the rishis say, say about spiritual experience. Surely that's the second best thing we can fall back on because then we can learn exactly what these rishis uh, talked about or taught maybe 500 years ago, 100 years ago, 1000 years ago. So we get a whole mass of lovely literature about what the rishis have told us about the world and religion and God. So this is the second best place to find learn about religion. Now see, <clears throat> even though this seems like a straightforward exercise, it is not that simple. Let me just explain to you why. The experience of the rishis are very dynamic and they come out when they talk about the religious experience, it is almost like poetry. So it sounds very grand and great, but it's very poetic and very few people can understand this kind of very abstract poetry. So even though their teachings are very grand and great, we would prefer to fall back on second best. The second best is not to just study what they are taught, but to actually study their lives. Their lives themselves are very exciting and interesting because their lives in a way reflect their teachings. So the second best thing is, okay, the teachings about the spiritual experience, this is high, high stuff there. Failing that, we can look at their own lives because their lives are the best lesson for the rest of humanity. So look at the lives of the rishis. So the lives and teachings of great proponents of religion, the prophets or the rishis, is one of the best ways of acquiring religious knowledge. So we accept that. That's the second best. So scriptures are crucial. This is where the scriptures are. Records or written records about what the rishis are taught or how they lived becomes very important. Now you see, this is just still very general classification. The Hindus have now devised a method whereby they say there are some scriptures or some books of authority that require special, they have special significance. They are primary, means most important primary text. And there are other texts which are, the Hindus say are secondary or of lower importance or less importance. So the subdivided scriptures into two great portions. And again, I, let me tell you, scriptures are very important, holy books are very important because peop, to find people who are experienced in God are very difficult. These people are very difficult to find. They occur only once in a while. So the next best thing the human beings can or, or mankind can relate to is of course the books or the scriptures. The holy books are important. 
there is one religion that paid a heavy price because their books were destroyed. Their books were overnight a madcap king in a drunkard, drunkard, drunkard stupor decided to demolish or, or destroy, burn all the scripts of one particular religion. That religion paid a heavy price. And do you know what the what that religion what that religion is or name of the religion? The Zoroastrian religion, the Parsi religion. Their scriptures were burned overnight by a madcap king. You may be surprised to hear the name of that great king or that madcap king. He was called or he's called Alexander the Great. He's nothing, there's nothing great about a man who destroys the scriptures of a religion. So in, in one night when he was drunk, he just ordered all the scriptures, all the temples of Zoroastrian should be demolished. And the Zoroastrian paid a heavy price because they lost most of the scriptures. So the, Alex, the Zoroastrian don't call Alexander the Great, <laughs> Sikandar, we say in, in Hindi. They don't think he's great at all. But anyway, so scriptures are important. Now the Hindus, as I said, have divided the scriptures into two broad categories. One category that says of great importance, primary, are called Shruti scriptures, Shruti. The word Shruti comes from Sanskrit Shrutva, which means that which has been heard. So what are they talking about? How do you hear Shrutis? Whether you can, in deepest of meditation, you acquire knowledge, or if you like, you hear these marvelous teachings in the deepest of meditation. That's why perhaps they are called Shrutis. Or perhaps they were called Shrutis because they were passed on by word of mouth for many thousands of years before they were written down. But for whatever the reason, they are called Shrutis. Shrutis are the scriptures of authority of the Hindus. And these texts are classified as the four Vedas. From the Sanskrit root, Vida. Vida means to know. So what are they talking about? These are books of knowledge, but what kind of knowledge are we talking about? Are we talking about, say, knowledge about biology or chemistry or mathematics? Why are they calling the books of knowledge? The Vedas are books of knowledge of what? Of the nature of reality. What is this all about? Remember when we started teaching Hinduism, we said the name we give to our religion is not Hinduism at all, really, it's called Dharma. And Dharma is trying to make sense of the world that we live in. What is this all about? I want to understand this world. So we are trying to come to terms with the nature of reality. What is this real thing in front of us? What is the nature of reality is the right language. So the Vedas are not talking about, say, necessarily about biology or chemistry. They are talking about nature of reality, knowledge about the nature of reality. What is this all about? That's why they call books of knowledge, Vida. That gives us knowledge about what is this all about? What is this? What is this? We want to understand. That's why they call Vedas. From the Sanskrit root Vida. There are four Vedas that we have classified. You don't need to go into details for your GCSE, but just let me give you some brief idea regarding what the Vedas are all about. The most ancient Veda is called the Rig Veda. Then Rig Veda is set to music called Sama Veda. Then we had Yajur Veda, which is more kind of linked with this idea of liturgy, etc. And finally, we have got Atharva Veda. These are the four Vedas. <coughs> when you look at the text of the Vedas, well, how, are they, how are the Vedas compiled? Let me give you some brief, just brief idea about the Vedas and how they are compiled. You don't need to go into great detail. The early portion, the starting part of the Vedas normally, the early books of the Vedas, all the four Vedas are normally the Samhita portion or hymns. You say hymns? What, are, what hymns are there? We never heard of these hymns of the Vedas. Oh yes, you do. Whenever you do religious ceremony, suppose you're doing the viva ceremony, marriage ceremony, or you're doing any havan, etc., the, the hymns that the priests are singing are these hymns picked up from the Samhita, Samhita proportion of the Vedas. What are these hymns like? Let me just give you an idea. The ancient man, when, try, when he was trying to make sense of the world, he thought the best way to understand the world and come to grips with it is to personify it. So, for example, today we are under the force of Varun, you know, this rain god. So we are saying, let us personify the forces of nature. What are the forces of nature? Like fire, wind, uh, sun, etc. So this, all these forces of natural force that we see around us, let's personify them. Let's, them turn, let's turn them into personalities. So the wind god and the fire god and so on. And the hymns are in a way dedication to these forces of nature in a personalized manner. So when you hear this, uh, in the hymns in the Rig, whether they will recite when you're doing puja, worship, havan, 
etc. They will be singing the glories of Varun and Indra and Agni. So that is why you keep hearing the word Varun and Indra and Agni, but this is what they are doing. The personified forces of nature being worshipped, being adored. Why do you do that? Think about it. The ancient man thought, if I can keep these forces of nature under control and keep them in my, on my side, then I am safe. Let us try and build friendship with the forces of nature. So the Samhita portion was basically just doing that and we are still using, we are still you know, caught up with that. So we still use it in a mechanical manner without realizing what we are actually doing. We are appeasing the forces of nature saying, oh do not disturb us, oh wind and fire and be our friends rather than our foes. That is what we are doing when you are doing the Havan and the Viva ceremony and all that. So these are the first part of the Vedas are the Samhita portion, the hymns dedicated to the forces of nature. Okay? So you must know these things, it is nice for you to know where it comes from and what is its significance. Why did we Hindus cannot get fixated on that? This is the reason the ancient Hindu was trying to in a way control nature by appeasing nature, praising the glories of natural forces. It is understandable. Of course modern man we have moved on now. We do not need to do all that bobbing down to the force of electricity. We put it in wires and light up our offices and rooms happily and warm our places. This is your harness nature without singing their glories. Through science, you have done the same thing. So, this is the first part of the Vedas are the hymn portion, the Samhita portion. The second part of the Vedas are the liturgy. Liturgy means very elaborate ritual. You know, when you do certain ceremonies, they will ask you, to, oh, you turn, go around in this clockwise manner and then offer this flower and fruit and ghee and grain to the fire. So, all the liturgy how you should do the havan, what should the altar look like, what should be the measurements, uh, what you should offer to the, to, into the fire, how you should offer it, which hand you should use. This elaborate liturgy or ritual practice is the second portion of the Vedas. Deals with the karma kand, the ritualistic portion. It has got its own place. So far, the heart of Hinduism is, we are still seeing the superficial aspects of Hinduism. <coughs> In the Vedas, the end portion of the Vedas are called the Aranyak. And they are, Aranyak means things that were discovered in the forest through deep meditation. This is where the heart of Hinduism is. So if anybody says, you know, where do I learn Hinduism? Should I study? I say, if you study the hymns of the Vedas, where will you, you can perhaps become a good pujari and do some you know, religious ceremonies and charge money for it or something. If you say, um, should we do the liturgy? Well, if you want to do the formal worship, it will be useful. You want the heart of Hinduism, throbbing, exciting, philosophic heart of Hinduism, you need to go to the Aranyak of the Vedas. This is where most of the interesting stuff lies, the end portion of the Vedas. And these, these particular gems of philosophic knowledge are contained in short kind of, you know, little snippets scattered all over the four Vedas, and mostly in the Aranyak portion, and they are called Upanishad. The word Upanishad means, Upa means to come near and Shada means to destroy. So dear, he's telling me to come near and he'll destroy me. This is terrible. I don't want to go near this Upanishad. But really the meaning of Upanishad is very interesting. He says Upanishad means come near, I will destroy your delusion regarding the nature of reality. What you think this world is, is not so. There's something different. So you've got a deluded world, world view. You don't know exactly what this world is like. What is this universe all about? You want to know about the nature of reality, don't you? I will teach that to you, come near me. I will destroy your delusion, Shada, destroy the delusion regarding the nature of reality. These are called the Upanishads. There are 108 Upanishads or even perhaps more, but this is what is recorded. Most people do not you know, read any of them, but 10 or 11 of these are considered to be central, very important. And the modern Hindus will continue to, you know, understand those 10 or 11 central Upanishads or the key Upanishads of the Hindus. Some of the Upanishads are very tiny, only 12 verses, some 18 verses, some huge. But you know, for your information, this is the philosophic throbbing heart of Hinduism. So if somebody says, I want to understand religion, Hinduism, I said, are you serious? Go to the Upanishads. And most of us have not got even a single copy of a single Upanishad. They are tiny little booklets, 12 verses. They can be only one A4 sheet contains one Upanishad. They are that simple, but they are very powerful. Do you know why they are powerful? They are telling us about what happens when you experience God. 
That's what they're talking about, or experience spirit. Spirit means I am something special, Atman. I am the spirit, not what I think I am, but what I actually am. I actually experience who I truly am. And that is a thrilling exp experience. And when you try and give expression to it or try and give, put it in words, you struggle. The words are difficult. You can't, because you say, ah, you know, sometimes you something fantastic. Say, Explain, tell me what did you experience. Is, I can't tell you. No, 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 tell me. No, I can't. You know, this, is like, this is like that. Such a thrilling experience that defies simple classification or simple verbal explanation. So do you know what the rishis did or how they presented this idea? Through poetry. They never did sat down and debated and put tables for you to follow. They just flowed with poetry. And do you know why poetry are a powerful tool? Because poetry have the ability or, put, or giving, if you, uh, giving you an understanding or a under, depth of understanding of very difficult things which defy normal words using words. So that's why poetry are very powerful because they are used, using words are being used to express things which normally cannot be expressed through words. That's what poetry is all about. That's why people love poetry because somehow that, that combination of words gives you a deeper understanding about everything if you look at each and every word, there's nothing powerful. But when you put them in that particular group, they become poetic. They give you deeper understanding about nature of reality. They transcend words. That's why poetry are very powerful. That's why the Upanishads are always poetic. They are never argumentative, I debate with you, discuss with you what is God. They don't do that. They fly off. If you experience God, suppose you get a thrilling experience. What comes out of your mouth will be so poetic, naturally, you don't need to go into a school and learn how to do poetry. It will flow from you because you're trying to give expression to a very powerful experience. And the moment you open your mouth, wonderful stuff will come out. So the ancient and modern rishis of India have given expression to their spiritual experience through the Upanishads. I told you what the meaning of the Upanishad is. Come near, I'll destroy your delusion regarding the nature of reality. I'll tell you what this is truly all about, who you truly are. That is what Upanishads are. This is the throbbing heart of the Hindu religion. It's that most Hindus have not even heard of the word Upanishad, let alone read one. And you see, the thing is, you might say, oh, in that case, have we, have we lost? Have we lost out? No, we are very clever. So what we have is this. We've got one text that incorporates all these 108 Upanishads and ties it all together. One text contains all the, if you like, the, the, the juice of all the Upanishads, the heart of all the Upanishads, and that the Hindus know, that scripture the Hindus are aware of, and they use it in every home, you should find it. The one that cannot takes, if you like, the, the central teachings of all these different Upanishads and combines it into one textbook or one text. Can you guess what that text is? There you are, sharp cookie here, the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is nothing but the synthesis of all the Upanishads. You see, because Upanishads are difficult, I mean, very abstract. So, what happens with Krishna is that he has, if you like, synthesized, brought together all the different strands of thinking of the Upanishads, the experience of the Rishis, and put it in one text. That has become the text of authority of the Hindus, the Bhagavad Gita. The word Bhagavad means is holy, and Gita means a song. You see, again, the word song, song of the Lord, or song of, song of the uh, divine. So the Bhagavad Gita is also poetic in its style, but it in a way incorporates all this lovely stuff of the Upanishads into one textbook. Now the Bhagavad Gita would be considered a scripture of authority, if like it is containing the heart of the heart. All the Upanishad teachings combine, synthesize, and reconciled in one text. As I said, you must know a little bit about the Bhagavad Gita too, a little bit only. I said, this is the heart, the philosophic heart of Hindus, Hinduism. It has got about 700 verses. For your knowledge, you just need to know basics. If you do A-level with us, we will teach you the Bhagavad Gita as well as one of the Upanishads. Imagine you learn that if you do A-level. You study the Katha Upanishad, one of the most powerful Upanishads of these main 10 Upanishads. One of the central one is Katha Upanishad. So if you study A-level, we will, we, will, we will go through the whole Katha Upanishad with you and see how powerful it is, how dynamic it is, how exciting it is. But for GCSE, just the basic knowledge. So we talk about the Upanishad, we talk about the Bhagavad Gita, the scripture of authority. It's got 700 verses. In a way, the reason why the Bhagavad Gita is perhaps even better than the Upanishad is because it doesn't give you just free-flowing poetry. It, in a way, allows you to translate these marvelous teachings into practice. 
Otherwise, religion is just pure theory. So, the Bhagavad Gita tells us not only about the theory of Hinduism, it also tells us how to put them into practice. It is teaching us how to use religion in our daily lives. Bhagavad Gita can, uh, Upanishads are poetry. They don't say, oh, do this, don't. The, open, the Bhagavad Gita translates these teachings, Mahal's teachings into practice, saying this is how you turn them into practice, not just preaching, turning them into practice. So this is the importance of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, so far, I have touched on some of the scriptures which are on this side, the scriptures of authority. So the key things you must remember, remember is Shruti, from the term Shrutva, the Vedas from the word Vida, books of knowledge about the nature of reality. And in the Vedas, you must know the Samhita portion, the hymns, the ritualistic portion, the Karmakan, and the Aranyak, which contain the Upanishad mostly, the philosophic heart of the Hindus, telling us how we can understand this reality in greater, greater depth. And then we say we synthesize the Upanishad, then we go to this marvelous text called the Bhagavad Gita, which contains. If somebody said in a few sentences, tell us what, is, what are the Upanishads about, what is the Shruti about, what the Vedas are all about, or what the Bhagavad Gita is all about, you can tell them in these few sentences, this is what they are all about. They are talking about the nature of reality. What is this all about? They are talking about our essential nature. Remember we studied that portion when we did section one, we touched, learned about the idea that our essential nature is quite different from what it appears. It's not the body or even the in mind that I possess and the intelligence that I have. Something great and grand about our essential nature, which is much more than just our body or our intelligence or our mind and our, all these things that we possess. It is the spirit, Atman. You are the spirit. So the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, this is what they talk about and teach about our essential nature of the spirit, Atman. What else do they talk about? They talk about the essential nature of this whole of this creation. You see, despite appearances underpinning this world, physical world with galaxies and stars and moons, underpinning this is also something very dynamic hiding underneath it. And that too is spirit. And we define that as Brahm. The, the Sanskrit pronunciation is Brahma, but in English we make it Brahman, and Atma becomes Atman. So carry, you know, flow with it. So the word Brahman, the principle that underpins this reality, spirit, that too comes from the Vedas, the Shrutis, the Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita. You see, all of them contain the same thing, the strands of this kind of teaching. Nature of reality, our essential nature is the spirit, Atman. Essential nature of the universe is Brahman. The relationship between Atman and Brahman, this is what they talk about, the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, and the Vedas. Now you see, again, one thing you notice so far, <coughs> we hardly use the word God. This is the flowing, deep ideas of Hindu religion. Most Hindus have lost all that. And all these gods and goddesses come in, all these personalities come in. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm simply saying, this is the central teaching. You are special, you are that. This is the teaching of the Upanishads and the Vedas. So we must recognize this, our essential nature is the spirit. So, so far I've touched on this aspect, the scriptures of authority based on the experience of human beings, ancient and modern, who became the prophets, the rishis of ancient and modern India. They are the foundation of Hinduism. But, even though, look, you are, you are already be, beginning to feel that I have lost you. You know, you feel that Dilip uncle is going on and on. What is the Atman and Brahman vegetables? What is this? It's tiresome. Chip. See, most people cannot relate to these things. It's too abstract. They need something that they can get their teeth into. So how can you get your teeth into religion? Stories, narratives. So we come to the second branch of the Hindu scriptures. These are the Shrutis. Now I'm going to talk about the second branch of the Hindu scriptures called the Smritis. Smritis means, I just told you, this abstract principle of Atman and Brahman is difficult to get your mind around. It's too abstract. It's principle oriented. And the, English, the Sanskrit word is apurusheya. It's very principle oriented. It becomes ah, difficult to digest, difficult to understand, difficult to relate to, and you all go blank on me straight away. When I talk of the Smriti scriptures, you suddenly see, wow, yeah, this is good stuff here. Because now we use the most important tool human beings have created, narrative, storytelling. I can present the same idea that I find in the Upanishad, in a story-like manner, you'll go, yeah, I like that stuff. You'll immediately relate to it. You'll smile. You'll go away feeling, yes, I understood religion. 
If I just give you Atman and Brahman, you'll go away feeling constipated. Oh, difficult to digest. If I present the same ideas through this colorful narrative, you'll say, I love Hinduism, I understand everything now. So this abstract principle becomes digestible, accessible through the narrative, the Smriti scripture. Do not underestimate the power of the narrative, the storytelling. Look, I've not done any story so far and you're beginning to feel tired already, aren't you? I'll give you a story in a minute and soon you'll get light up and say, yeah, now this is beginning to make sense. It's the moment you tell anybody there's a story, their ears prick up straight away. Have you noticed? Young or old, you can relate to ideas, difficult ideas in a story much more than you can through abstraction, just principle, principle. It may be true, but it's tiring. That is why we created a whole mass of narrative without feeling, without apologizing. Sita, um, the work you do uh, goes under the name of people care. Does it mean you're looking after people? Uh, is it because you know you care for people? That's why I call it people care. Uh, well, the name people care actually comes from the name of the Indian people tree, which is known for its sheltering and nurturing properties, and that's the philosophy that we would like to incorporate um, as part of our care work. Good. What kind of care work, I mean, what kind of care service do you provide? Um, well, we provide a mixture of hourly care where, for example, uh, somebody needs a bath in the morning. And we also provide live-in care where, for example, the care worker lives with the client for 24 hours a day. <coughs> Now you say that looking after the elderly people in their own homes is better than sending them, than sending them to a care home. So why do you say that the elderly people in their own homes are better than sending them to a care home? What is the reason behind that? What is the reason behind that? Well, everyone prefers the comfort of their own home. And not only that, but they also are surrounded by their family and friends and their loved ones. So staying in your own home allows greater interaction with your loved ones. But surely in some cases it's almost impossible to look after the elderly in, the, in your own homes because circumstances may be so difficult. Surely you know, there must be some situation like that. Yes, uh, there may be medical conditions which make it almost impossible to live in your own home. And in those cases, yes, you would need to use a care home. Um, but perhaps this should be more of an exception rather than a rule. Okay, sounds like a good idea, looking after the elderly in your own home. But surely it must be a very expensive exercise. If you compare the costing, um, it can actually work out cheaper to have a carer in your own home rather than be moved to a care home. And we at People Care can help you in terms of uh, providing this sort of service. Surely in this country social services provide this service, so do you work with social services or how does it work? Um, yes, so you can get in touch with your local social services and if you like we can help you in that process. And social services can then give you a personal budget um, and we as People Care Agency try to work as much as possible within that budget. So you can actually get care at home free of charge. Good. One, last, one other question, what kind of care workers do you kind of, you know, uh, employ? Well, we make sure that the carers are genuinely caring people because you can't be in this industry without being genuinely caring. And we also try and match clients uh, with certain languages. For example, a lot of our clients and carers are Gujarati speaking and we try and match them with each other. So you are saying that you are you continue to recruit a possible Gujarati or Hindi speaking care workers? Yes, we are always recruiting, so please do get in touch with us if you're looking to do care work. One final question. What prompted you then What prompted you to do such work? 
Well, sometimes when you go and visit a client's home and they hold your hand and they don't want to let go, or the smile that they have when they realise that we are providing a genuinely caring service makes it all really worthwhile. And it's not just for the client themselves, it's for the carers as well, who not only are getting a salary, but they are doing some very satisfying work. And sometimes when you even look at the faces of the family members of the elderly people who are now receiving care, you can see a great deal of relief because they are having to handle so many responsibilities, but now they can have their burden eased. Thank you, Sita.